have no experience with THC in terms of using that. My whole experience has been with cannabidiol. Not to say that I am biased in one way or another, it's just that's been my experience thus far. The other thing is that I am extremely passionate about using CBD and its use medically uh, to the point where um, I may have emotional moments that I, I may have to pause a minute to handle those emotions because the, the impacts that I've seen with CBD are absolutely life transforming. So you get an idea of uh, my background from here. And then you have to ask, like, what are you doing here? And what, why are you here to talk to us about this? And that's, that's because of the extraordinary experience that I've had uh, working and learning about cannabidiol and its performance within the body and its transformative ability uh, for uh, people. So I've given you an overview of what I want to talk about here today. I want to get a number of different subjects, and, and I need to lay some groundwork because I can't assume that you necessarily know some of the details that are involved here. And I don't want to frame it up for you so you get some of the idea. Of course, what is PTSD? We'll, we'll go over that. I'll give you an overview of what we're talking about there. And then the endocannabinoid system. How many of you are familiar with the endocannabinoid system? All right, good, so that's great. I don't have to go too far on that, but I'm gonna give you my particular spin and tell you how I look at the endocannabinoid system. And then we'll talk about how does cannabidiol hook up into the endocannabinoid system, and more about the other relationships that cannabidiol has uh, to the body and the other systems that we're working on. And then from there, I want to show you how cannabidiol can impact specifically PTSD. What this could really do. Because when we, but you know, when I'm talking about PTSD, I'm, I'm, yes, I'm focused on PTSD today, but I have to tell you that the, the changes in the endocannabinoid system that we're seeing is, this is, it seems to be an epidemic of dysfunction and deficiency that we're encountering with many of our modern diseases uh, in the endocannabinoid system. And that, that is, seems to be the perpetrator of a lot of problems that we're running into. And cannabidiol could have a role for making the changes necessary and restoring the endocannabinoid system so that it can be, uh, the body can work more healthy and more effectively. And then I wanna give you some uh, case studies on, on what I have seen specifically with PTSD and the response from CBD. And then we'll take some questions and answers. Okay, when we're talking about PTSD, um, it's a syndrome. And you gotta understand from a doctor's standpoint, uh, a syndrome is what, what the medical profession does not know. It's, and what we do is we collect a whole bunch of symptoms and signs, we pull them all together, and we create a disease entity and we call it a syndrome. Well, PTSD is kind of in that boat because it's full of a number of different symptoms and, and the collection is very wide and broad. But we've really been talking about, we've known about PTSD for centuries. In fact, every time soldiers go to war, there is a disease that comes out of that. It may be bowel fatigue, it, it may be shell shock, but all of these are the same thing. We're really talking about the same entity. We're just getting, a, getting it a different name and there's a different theory about how it works and there's also a new theory about how to treat it and what the effective approaches are. So the typical symptoms that, that I wanna focus on today is, is the avoidance. Uh, and the, um, that um, people have, and I want to use people very carefully uh, because I don't want to confine this just to the military. So there, for, for these people who are suffering PTSD, there's an, uh, there's an avoidance. They don't want to be around people. They don't want to be around places. These, it turns them into hermits, and they have a withdrawal kind of function. And probably that's because they're trying to get away from any triggers that could bring back and make them relive those experiences. Now those reliving those experiences, which is another key symptom, are, are a recreation, an exact recreation. Either it's in a daydream or it's in a nightmare. 
of the, what happened to them and the trauma that they perceived, their feelings and emotions, and the physiologic effects that happened when they were traumatized. There's a number of other symptoms that go along with it, and I'll dig down into that a little bit more. It's also a common occurrence. We're looking at soldiers, you're hearing it on the news about uh, this soldier was injured, you're seeing, hearing the debate uh, within um, Congress and the news media about uh, how the military is not supporting their PTSD soldiers. But I gotta tell you, that's only 30% of the people who are actually suffering with PTSD. So it's a relative minority. Yeah, they get the headline, but there's a lot of other people out there that are suffering. And then we're going to have to talk a little bit about fear memory because it's different than the other memory that you think of. But usually we think of, okay, memory once and it's in there. I want to get locked in. I want a mind like a steel trap. Lock that memory in and take care of it. But that's not how fear memory works. Fear memory is a gift that keeps on giving. Every time that a trigger happens, that memory it reoccurs within the brain. It's re remember and it establishes a new circuit to the point where circuit after circuit after circuit is stacked up that goes to the brain and reinforces that particular experience and it's mostly about the emotion it's mostly about the terror it's not about remembering the facts the places and the people and the dates it's about remembering the terror it's an emotional memory it gets locked in and recurs and recurs and recurs. But there's one healthy alternative that we have. We can forget it. And if it's done in the right environment, if we remember in the right environment, it's possible through the physiology to extinguish that and to reduce it and to forget that particular emotional memory that happens. So here we talk about the major symptoms that, that are occurring. And what I want to point out is the, that all of these symptoms uh, that are happening with the flashbacks, the super alertness, the avoidance, and the negative thoughts and mood are associated with a lot of physical uh, symptoms as well, <coughs> physical findings and physical events. And so the hormones are absolutely surging, and they're, and they're surging and there's a fight or flight response. So the cortisol is, is, is pumping through the body, you've got adrenaline pumping through the body, Heart is racing, blood pressure is rising, uh, there's uh, sweating, uh, there's anxiousness, and their eyes are wide open in a huge stare. And those classic pictures of PTSD and battle fatigue show a wide-eyed stare, which is absolutely characteristic. And that's physiologically exactly what you see when you have large amounts of adrenaline circulating through the body. The negative thoughts and moods are really important because these people, these people are encountering an emotional uh, distraughtness. They feel worthless. They feel sad. They feel like they're at fault and they're ashamed that they are alive in this situation, which naturally that's gonna lead to the suicide that we hear about. It's always a threat with this particular syndrome. So this is really common. We're talking about 3.5% of the United States population has this condition. And in fact, it's a lot more common in women, where we see 50% of rape cases are actually manifesting PTSD. And what about uh, child abuse? The same thing's happening with that. So yeah, the military gets the headlines, but nobody's talking about the other group that's out there. And they're the large population who really suffer. And what, in terms of numbers, we're talking close to nine million people that have this condition at any time during the year. So a huge, huge number, it's out there. It's all over, but people don't talk about it because we don't talk about our psychological issues to our friends, to our neighbors. That doesn't happen. We keep those hidden, and these people are avoiding even any mention to avoid those triggers that could have them relive that experience. Okay, let's let's frame this in the endocannabinoid system. I think I said before that the endocannabinoid system looks like that is possibly the keystone 
as to what's going on with the number of physiologic diseases that we encounter. So where is this? What is it? Well, we've known about the endocannabinoid system since 1992. Um, there's well over 7,000 articles, medical articles, that have been researched on it. And not only that, the drug companies are going bonkers and trying to find a drug that's going to encounter with those uh, endocannabinoids. The first successful drugs are cannabinoids that actually were a failure. And every time they try, tried to produce an artificial cannabinoid, it has failed. But the, the, the synthetics don't work well, and the substances do not work well in isolation. What you need is a blend, you need a combination, you need a, a, a natural plant product that's coming in that has its associated molecules with it. So let me get back to the endocannabinoid system. Where is it in the body? Now it aligns itself a lot with the nerve tissue because one of its key functions is that a regulator of the synapse. Those spots between the nerves where one nerve talks to another nerve. And so it's modulating, it's controlling, it's actually turning up the volume or turning down the volume of the neurotransmitters that are going back and forth. But it's also located everywhere in the body. It's located in the gut and the intestine in a big way. And if you don't know it already, we produce more neurotransmitters in the intestine than we do in the brain. So it's an important area and it's been commonly overlooked in terms of looking at that as an endocannabinoid organ and sensitive area. And so the logic says, hey, this could be a, an excellent area for doing some manipulation and some uh, helpful restoration of the gut as well as the psyche. So it's also located in almost all your organ systems and it has an effect on the organ systems. Now what does it consist of? Well, there are activators and then there's receptors, and they fit like a key into a lock, turn things on and turn things off, activate some sort of action within the cell, right down to the cellular level, but even deeper than the cell. Sometimes it's a mitochondria, sometimes it's a nucleus, turning on genes and turning them off in a field called epigenetics. But in addition, there are also substances that break down the cannabinoids. So you were talking about the, uh, the degradation or the breaking down, and that's what gets rid of the cannabinoids, gets them out of the circulation and out of the action area. And, it, and if you change those things that break it down, you're going to increase the duration of action for um, the cannabinoids, the natural cannabinoids that are there. Okay, what's the purpose? I want to, and the, and the idea of the, of the cannabinoid, the endocannabinoid system, it's a fine tuning system and a translator for what happens outside the body and for what happens at the cellular level. And it's doing a lot of delicate manipulation, making uh, turning things up and turning things down so that we can live our lives as normally as possible. But there are other activators of the endocannabinoid system, and that's what we're talking about with cannabis. Cannabis has a collection of cannabinoids that has an influence exactly on the endocannabinoid system. But it's not, it's more than just cannabinoid. It's also substances like truffles and chocolate and even activities like long distance running where you build up your, um, your feel good sort of thing that we've attributed to endorphins. But endorphins can't get to the brain. So it has to be at the endocannabinoids turning on and increasing the amount of endocannabinoids that are circulating. And there are other substances as well, but that's what leads me into the, the topic of cannabidiol. Before I go there, uh, let's talk about um, the endocannabinoid system in PTSD. So what I've got here is a PET scan of the cannabinoid receptors going on inside of a PTSD patient. And what we're seeing here is, oops, sorry, is an increase in the number of receptors, endocannabinoid receptors, but a decrease in the actual endocannabinoids. And we're seeing also a decrease in those other uh, hormones that are there, those activators, 
um, where the cortisol is, is increased, uh, or it's, it's manipulated, it's changed, so that the effects from the cortisol and the adrenaline are more pronounced um, on these brains. And, but on the other hand, you can uh, see that uh, for the trauma victim, that's not happening. You're not seeing the endocannabinoid changes that happen in a normal trauma victim. And you're not seeing it in healthy individuals. So this particular pattern appears to be unique uh, to uh, PTSD. This is an objective evidence that we're dealing with an endocannabinoid deficiency or a dysfunction within the body. So let's talk a little bit more about cannabidiol and, and how it works. First of all, cannabidiol comes from cannabis. Now, for my purposes, we're really talking about two plants. One is the marijuana plant that contains THC, but very low levels of CBD. And we're talking about hemp that contains high levels of CBD, but very low levels of THC. The main point I want to get across to you is that CBD restores normal balance. It's not going to make you superhuman. It's not going to create something that's not there, that you already don't have. It's going to restore people to normal. Now for athletes and people who are in great shape and great condition, well that's no big deal at all. That's not going to make any headlines. But for many of us, who are working with a depleted system in some way that's not working properly, getting back to normal is a big, big deal. It's a major, major event for us. So CBD seems to act on those receptors like a key in the lock, just like the other cannabinoids. But I gotta tell you that CBD is a very promiscuous molecule. It's making contact with all of the other systems of the body the immune system, the gastrointestinal system, the neurologic system, um, as well as the hormone system. It's making connections and it's forming actions, it's producing actions in those particular areas as well. And I've counted over 40 different mechanisms of action that are well outside the limited range that we know about the endocannabinoid system. In addition, if you're returning your body to normal, if you're restoring the endocannabinoid system, what are the side effects to getting to normal? Well, there's no side effects to getting to normal. That's going to be the healthy. You're going to eliminate side effects. Exactly. And that's what we're seeing with CBD, that people get back to normal. So rather than having side effects or toxicities, which don't occur with CBD, you're not seeing any of that. And there's, of course, there's no psychoactive effects that occur with cannabis. So now we're going to dig down a little bit into the weeds. We're going to talk about the fear memory and about what exactly is going on, particularly in PTSD. What we're seeing here is that CBD seems to restore the endocannabinoid system. It's making some changes and it's correcting some of the dysfunction and the irregularities and the deficiencies that are going on. In the first case, um, uh, and then um, it's also changing, I told you it was promiscuous, it's also involved in the fear memory. And it's working on two pathways. We talked a little bit earlier about the different processes. That every time a trigger happens in PTSD, you're re-remembering an event. You're re-remembering the terror that you may have experienced. Now, and every time that happens, it is getting locked in, another circuit is being added, and it's easier and easier to get to that terror situation once again. Well, CBD seems to block that path. It prevents that, that particular memory pathway. Now, normally we don't want CBD to block normal pathways, but in this case, we've got a pathologic situation going on. And CBD steps up and it blocks this particular pathway. On the other hand, CBD is actually promoting the forgetting or the extinction of these memories by enhancing that particular connection and making it so that you can forget to do that. I mean, if you look at it and you think about this, this is a natural process, a natural process that goes on. But how do we deal with traumatic situations? Because most people don't develop PTSD. It tends to be a minority. So what is it? What happens? 
Well, I showed you this slide that shows that there's an abnormality that it seems to occur with PTSD, an objective abnormality that's occurring on the PET PET scan. And here we have a mechanism where the body can restore itself, at least in the memory process. And then we can get the endocannabinoid system restored, decreasing the number of receptors that are available, increasing the amount of cannabinoids that are also there to activate them. And then we've got the cortisol and the adrenaline acting as well. And these are important players in the process where you get the terror and situations um, and the anxiety, where you have a rise in those particular uh, hormones and, and uh, that CBD seems to normalize them. I'm not gonna tell you that it lowers them or it elevates them because CBD is a very smart molecule. In fact, I call it the world's smartest molecule because it's always um, controlling and regulating things and returning them to normal. You've got normal function that occurs. In those situations, it's reducing that physiologic response and reactivity to try to forget the memory and prevent the reestablishment and reconnection that goes on. So I got a couple of case studies uh, to talk to you about. My first experience with PTSD, I didn't realize what was going on. I met an 82-year-old Korean War veteran. His daughter asked me to see if I could help him with some PTSD, with some CBD, because it could be effective uh, for his uh, dementia and his diabetes and some of these other issues. Essentially, he was sitting like a vegetable in front of the TV, and he was watching television, but he wasn't communicating with the family. He did a lot of restless sleeping up at night, just various sorts of behavior. But I, I did notice that every month uh, I heard that he was going to Orlando to talk with some of his veteran buddies. That was very important, but I didn't understand why. We got him started on CBD, and within um, two weeks, um, he wouldn't stop talking. Um, and he was activated to the point where he wanted to do everything. He wanted to get out and do stuff. Not only that, he was remembering things from the Korean War. He was remembering and he described his traumatic experience with his squad going after a machine gun nest um, among, in, in, the, in the North Korea, uh, where his squad was wiped out. He was successful at the mission, but the squad was walked out, wiped out along the way. He made it back to friendly lines, but he could name the squad members he could name the unit, he could name the treating doctors that were involved with his care later on. So later on, after a little while, it was quite surprising to me. Again, I didn't make the connection of what was going on, but he clearly had uh, PTSD. And what he was talking about, and he, and he thanked me very, very vigorously. And he thanked me for, and, and I want to quote, um, getting him out of being a broccoli and allowing him to tell his story to the point where he was asking for my help to write his memoir. Really impressive and really heartwarming. So I decided that we need to drill down into the PTSD, um, especially for veterans, and I contacted Realm of Karen. Now this is a foundation in Colorado Springs that is providing free service to people who want to know and want to learn about cannabis and how it can treat their problem, whatever that is. And I asked them who I should go to to find a group of veterans or any PTSD patients who would be interested in giving a trial of CBD. So they directed me to uh, Dr. Vaughn Miller and Dr. Uh, Sue Cecily. And they asked, they suggested I get in contact and I did, and I contacted them, and they recommended that I talk to a group called We for Warriors. So I got in contact with them in a Wisconsin group that had about 10 members, and asked them if they would be interested, contacted their leadership, and they said they would. What I had them do was to use uh, a Google form and to complete a questionnaire that was characteristic of what the VA was currently offering in terms of their initial assessment for PTSD. So that's what you see over here on the right. Uh, and, you, and the purple and the green means that they all have it. 
These are the typical symptoms that we talked about earlier. They, they all have these symptoms, and it's very severe in terms of the symptomatology that they have. And then I got them started with some liposomes, um, taking five pumps twice a day from uh, the, the elixinol product. Within days, these people had a dramatic response. And it was across the board in terms of the benefits that they were seeing. Here, here we have one example where this gentleman is 555 for all of the symptoms we talked about before, and many more, including pain, which is not really a characteristic of PTSD by itself. All of these things drop down dramatically in a matter of a, a, a few days. Three days, we're down to one. Now, I have an explanation for the five on uh, after a week, because he felt so good on day three that he mowed the lawn and took care of all the work tasks that he'd been putting off for days, weeks, months, and years. He was a little bit sore on that day. He didn't quite recognize that at the time. He just pointed that out to him that mowing the lawn may not have been the best thing to do that after he felt, he felt improved. But these aren't the only ones. Because I want to talk about a couple other people and what they experienced. So, in particular, I'm going to skip Jones. I'm going to go straight to Jane. Now, Jane was a, an individual who um, was in a combat aviation unit. Um, she had some traumas in that unit, but the, as a result of those experiences, a lot of her PTSD came up as uh, she realized it was related to a sexual assault that she had when she was seven years old. And all of these feelings and emotions and that terror came up to her, and she was having to deal with it. Got her started on CBD, and she had a dramatic turnaround. Uh, again, within a day, she had a calmness and a relaxation and an ability to remember the details and the events, but without the emotion. So the emotion was separated from it. That's a big point I want to make to you, is that we're talking about fear memory. It's the, it's the memory of the terror. It's the memory of the feeling, not the events that go on to it. She also saw a vast array of other improvements that went on to it, um, including improved cognition and communication, as well as the resolution of uh, issues with sleep and uh, also pain. So that's cannabidiol, but I need to talk to you a little bit about what the sources are for cannabidiol. In terms of our experience and what I'm seeing, you want to find a cannabidiol that is coming from an excellent source. You want to have it as a as a, as a whole or a uh, from an organic plant um, derivative, so that it has the blend of other substances that need to be there. Isolated CBD has not shown the performance where it's been blended with other plant extracts. We need, and, and talking about the different forms that are there, there cannabidiol is essentially is a, is a oil-like substance. It's a small molecule, um, but because it's an oil, it generally it can't be mixed with water. Well, some of the development, and with the liposomes is a good example, where they've made the molecules much smaller and they've wrapped it with a phosphate skin so that now it's water soluble. And there are more products like that that are being developed. So you're going to see a cascade of different things that are going to be available uh, that are going to meet the needs of individuals with different problems of all ages. And then if we're talking about companies, there's a lot of companies out there that are offering products um, for CBD. Um, how do you evaluate those particular companies? You can look at it in terms of the company's leadership, their experience, what their goals are, what they're trying to do, and maybe even some of the associations they have with other organizations that are giving back. People like, people like the uh, realm of caring or um, involved in study with uh, John Hopkins, um, who are doing the research and they're trying to gather the information, give us more information about what CBD and what the cannabinoids can do for us. Now, in this particular program that I'm using, I'm just using uh, five pumps of the uh, liposomes uh, twice a day, but I liberalize that and I allow these um, people to use 
as much as they need or as little as they need. Though just one aside is that what I've seen it is it happened and you can imagine, they were all um, uh, marijuana users, at least most of them were. They had, they didn't, they weren't using their marijuana as much. They decreased their dose typically by half um, when they were using the CBD. They didn't need it and they didn't have the side effects, the psychoactive side effects that came along with using the THC that was essential for some of their pain relief. When I'm recommending CBD, I want people to use it early and to make changes to that dose early and to do vigorous about those changes. We're not talking about micro moles, we're talking about uh, using, uh, doubling the dose, finding what works. Because if you don't find out what works with these people early on, they're not going to use it. Find out what the dose works, uh, works with them and get them to a therapeutic level. In 90% of the case, I'm seeing response. You just have to get to the right dose level. But let me wrap this up by just saying that PTSD is very common. It, it's out there everywhere. They're all around you. But the endocannabinoid dysfunction is a key element of PTSD and needs to be addressed. And CBD is effective for PTSD. Now, there's a number of mechanisms that are working and are valuable. But most of all, I think you have to understand that CBD is restoring people to normal not doing anything exceptional, it's not creating uh, superhumans, it's just getting people back to what their full potential is. So finally, I want to just say that hemp is legal everywhere. It's legal in every state, in every territory, and it's legal in most countries throughout the world. And it's available right now. Thank you.